And we're going to move on now to Austin Stewart. He will be presenting on taste and adaptability, an examination of opera and racial uplift. Austin Stewart is a PhD candidate in historical musicology at the University of Michigan. He researches opera and civic identity in the American West during the 19th century with an emphasis on the theaters, performances, and artists encountered by the citizens of Denver. He has worked with Michigan Opera Theater to develop adult and college age audiences, as well as a new K through 12 educational performance based on the lives of African-American artists and athletes called I Too Sing America. Thank you, Jessica. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here wrapping up uh, this session of the symposium. Um, I have the distinction of not talking about the Gershwin's Porgy and Best today. Um, so if you're here solely for that, um, I'm, I'm, I apologize in advance. Um, one kind of shameless plug before I begin my paper um, proper is just to invite you to please um, visit this website, www.i2singamerica.com. Um, there you can view the just released video of a January 26th performance called Out of the Silence that University of Michigan School of Music Theater and Dance students produced. Um, at the University of Michigan Museum of Art celebrating African-American classical musicians of the past and bringing some of those text stories and songs to life. Um, so please check this out and uh, up my um, rating on Google search. Thank you. The 19th century African-American experience in lyric theater was initially limited by and respondent to blackface minstrelsy. For some black American musicians, comedians, actors, and singers, portraying the stereotyped characters in the popular genre offered perhaps the only point of entry for a career on stage. Over time, these artists began to cultivate their own celebrity, and the novelty of hearing black singers in genres other than minstrelsy presented new, albeit infrequent, prospects. The distance between opera and minstrelsy was not as great as it might seem today. Both were mainstream entertainments, performed by touring traveling troops across the country, and marketed to middle class audiences. During Reconstruction, African American musicians began to redress the distance, the relationship between these two forms of theater. Some integrated vernacular musical traditions, minstrelsy, and opera in original works that celebrated blackness. Others rejected these traditions in an effort to create a school of black opera, legitimized by its similarities to European opera and its liberation from minstrelsy. In the first place, I consider today the Higher Sisters Ballad Opera Out of Bondage, which endeavored to legitimize operatic performance by African Americans by ensconcing it within genres that did permit them authorship. In the latter, I consider the first of many attempts made by Harry Lawrence Freeman to ingratiate the operatic art to black intellectuals. In 1878, James Monroe Trotter recall recalled in his book, Music and Some Highly Musical People, the experience of hearing Anna Maida and Emma Louise Hires for the first time. The writer recalls with much pleasure the delightful emotions which were awakened in his breast by the very graceful stage appearance and the divine harmony produced by these accomplished mu musicians. He could not repress the thoughts that came forcibly into his mind of not only how much these noble artists were doing for the cause of pure music, but for that other righteous one, the breaking down of a terribly cruel prejudice founding on the accident, so to speak, of the color of the face. Trotter, himself born a slave and now writing in Boston, the epicenter of art, music, and musical criticism in 19th century America, used his book to validate black artists whose music and performance comported with his aesthetic sensibilities. He included the higher sisters not only for their accomplishments and sweet voices, but also for the nobility of their mission, a mission to advance pure music, that is, art music produced by trained musicians, 
that was enjoyed by racially heterogeneous audiences and to expedite social change in their performances. The Higher Sisters made their debut at the Metropolitan Theater in their hometown of Sacramento, California on April 20th, 1867. From the beginning, they were regarded as a novelty not only because of the color of their skin, but also the incredible quality of their voices. In the fall of 1871, when Ana Meda and Emma Louise were 16 and 14 years old, they set off from California on the first of several cross-continental tours. Their foreign language repertoire, recorded in reviews and concerts given in San Francisco, Salt Lake City, Missouri, Cleveland, Boston, and New York, to name just a few, was remarkable. Animeda included Norma's Casta Diva, Violetta's A Forse Lui Che Al Anima, and Leonora's D'Amor Sulali Rose. Together, they performed complete scenes from the first and second acts of Donizetti's Linda di Chamonix. Emma Louise, whose rep solo repertoire was not as carefully cataloged as her sister's, specialized more so in character and folk songs, though in the sisters' duets from Verdi's I Mazzanieri and Flautau's Marta, she would also dress as a boy and sing the tenor's role, a practice of cross-dressing and gender ambiguity that filtered into their original works. On the whole, the public loved them. Animeda was likened to Jenny Lind and Euphorosine Pareparosa, and one reviewer noted that a number of competent musicians from St. Joseph, Missouri, the rural south of all places, uh, quote, pronounced her voice perfectly wonderful. Their promoters foregrounded these favorable comparisons to white European prima donnas to help gain for the sisters respect, admiration, and patronage. By 1875, they had successfully entered a network of itinerant musicians touring rurban, rural and urban America, performing for white and black audiences with Calendar's Georgia Minstrels, the first all-black minstrel troupe, and also on independent concerts of foreign language opera favorites. Yet while they enjoyed an enthusiastic following, there existed no immediate opportunity for them to perform complete operatic works. Finding their way in, onto the lyric stage would require a careful navigation of genre crossing between minstrelsy and opera. The sisters eventually came under the professional management of Boston's Red Path Lyceum Bureau, the only African Americans musician, only African American musicians represented by the same company that managed the speaking engagements of Frederick Douglass and later Booker T. Washington. In August 1875, the company printed a circular announcing the premiere during the following season of a, quote, operetta, written expressly for the higher sisters, quote, illustrated of the progress of the colored race. This would be, Red Path stated proudly, the greatest dramatic and musical novelty of the centennial year, typifying the emergence of the race from slavery to freedom. Joseph Bradford, the white playwright assigned to the project, was born into a slave-holding family near Nashville, Tennessee in 1843. After breaking ties with his family and fighting for the Union Army, he made his way to Boston to pursue a career in, playwright and act, in, in acting and playwriting. He devised a story that would feature the sisters in songs heard during their days with the Georgia minstrels, as well as the operatic repertoire that had, init uh, that had initially brought them acclaim. Red Path emphasized in its publicity that the work should not be confounded with a, quote, minstrel show, but understood as a high-class dramatic and musical entertainment appealing to the most cultivated portion of the community as well as the general amusement seeker. By definition, Out of Bondage is a ballad opera in which spoken dialogue alternates with popular songs adapted for the purposes of the story. Bradford's text called for the inclusion of plantation, jubilee, and slave songs, which Redpath promised would be given in a manner that had never before been heard, as well as music of a higher order, which would be beautifully rendered and intelligently interpreted by the company. Out of bondage dramatized the higher sisters' pursuit of a professional career as artists, instilled with their own celebrity and an, an, an acted dissemblance from minstrelsy. 
divided into three acts, each part of Out of Bondage was titled in the Red Path circulars, Slavery, Freedom, and Up North or Five Years After Emancipation. A typical synopsis reads, the first act represents the Negro in his home in a state of bondage. The second, his admission to freedom by the approach of the Union Army and the parting of the young folks from the old. The former going north with the army, leaving the latter on the plantation. The third, after a separation of five years, the old folks come north and meet the young, who by this time have attained to affluence. That's from the New York Clipper. Um, kind of uh, leading the way for their premiere in New York. The characters initially resemble stock figures encountered in minstrelsy and literature of the time. The older generations constituting Uncle F, similar to Uncle Tom, and Aunt Naomi, similar to Mammy, and the younger generation with Henry and Kalula, the young field hands played by Sam Lucas and Emma Louise Hires, and the female house servant Narcisse, played by Anna Maida. Importantly, the younger characters refuse to remain static or complacent in their stereotypes in this slavery to freedom story. At the beginning, the text of Kolula is written in a phonetic approximation of a vernacular dialect. After she is freed and educated in the North, her lines are written in standard English. Narcisse has already dropped the folk accent and figures of speech by the beginning of the opera. In act three, which is set in an, 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 an elegant interior room in Boston, she speaks in terms that foreshadow the philosophy of intellectuals of a decade later. Quote, we have found that freedom does not mean idleness but labor, that neither man nor woman has any right to live in the world without striving to make it better, end quote. For that matter, Uncle F is perplexed to see the young characters wearing their Sunday clothes on a Thursday and outright incredulous when he discovers that they do so because they have a performance that evening, that they make their living singing and playing the piano. Not unlike other ballad operas, Out of Bondage welcomed flexibility in its musical numbers, though some showpieces seem to have appeared consistently. For example, Sam Lucas, one of the most celebrated entertainers of his generation in minstrelsy, sang Carved That Possum, a piece that he had made popular during his time with Calendar's Minstrels, and which established his, his, his popularity and also now his character's position within this family. Didn't My Lord Deliver Daniel, Stephen Foster's My Old Kentucky Home, and other popular anti-slavery ballads and spirituals were also featured. For Lucas and Emma Louise, Charles A. White, a Boston-based composer, wrote a new duet in minstrel guise, Goodbye, Old Cabin Home, in which Emma Louise sang the line, I's gonna be a Yankee, I is as sure as you're born. By lampooning plantation life and minstrel stereotypes in the first act, the artists engage what they should do. Their subsequent emancipation and artistic independence allowed them to demonstrate what they could do. The text of Out of Bondage has no finite ending. It closes with an invitation for the artist to perform a grand concert. From the 1876 circular, we know that Sam Lucas offered Shivering and Shaking Out in the Cold, a slow, pathos-filled ballad that describes impoverished living in urban society, irregardless of race. The song, which breaks with the thematic and stylistic features of the minstrel songs that had made him famous, was modeled on parlor songs in standard English with no explicit mention of race. Lucas remained with the Higher Sisters Company through 1877 season, at which time he left to become the first black performer to reclaim the title character in Uncle Tom's Cabin on stage. From the 1877 Red Path Circular, we know that Anameda and Emma Louise returned to their operatic roots for the concert, offering selections from Il Trovatore and Ernani. They continued to perform the work for 15 seasons, and many reviews suggest a continuous inclusion of their early opera concert repertoire, leading one reviewer in rural Iowa to state, quote, the concert showed that the troupe in voice and culture could compare with any of their white brethren and sisters in the successful rendition of the best and most difficult music. In Out of Bondage, the Higher Sisters were able to leverage their celebrity as one-time child prodigies to gain backing from producers unaffiliated with minstrelsy productions. 
Through subsequent works, the sisters overtly celebrated their blackness on stage. Their ability to couch their own dignity in works that dismantled race and gender politics challenged white constructed images of black Americans. The higher sisters were among the few who pride, few performers who pride open lyric theater to lead the way for future generations of black Americans to perform and create opera. One of those was Harry Lawrence Freeman. In 1915, Freeman penned an article for the AME Church Review titled, The Negro in the Higher Altitudes of Music in This Country and Through the World which reflected upon the status, accomplishments, and difficulties met by black classical musicians. He said, the Negro occupies a unique position in the realms of musical art. I employ the term unique rather than important, inasmuch as he has not as yet revealed to the world at large his true musical value. Writing for a periodical whose mission was to give to the world the best thoughts of the race, Freeman recognized that African-American composers had succeeded in writing smaller musical forms, but had not been afforded the opportunity to compose grand works, symphonic or operatic, especially ones that did not rely upon musical idioms that were reminiscent of, if not drawn from spirituals. Freeman worked resolutely to correct this. He was the first African-American composer to attain recognition as a composer of opera, and in a career spanning more than five decades and yielding 22 operas, including a racial origin tetralogy entitled Zululand, he worked tirelessly and to his regret unsuccessfully at eradicating segregation in the creation and performance of grand opera. Born in Cleveland in 1869, Harry Lawrence Freeman attended his first opera um, a, a performance of Wagner's Tannhäuser in 1891. While he had grown up singing and playing piano and church organ in, uh, and organ in churches, it was this first experience that placed him on his path as a composer dedicated almost entirely to opera. Without any formal training, Freeman created his first compositions and his first libretti. In 1893, he performed, uh, he premiered his first two operas back to back within months of each other, Aftalia and The Martyr. Both were performed at, in Denver, where I come into this, mm -hmm. at the German Dance Hall and Theater with a cast of amateurs assembled from various black churches and social societies around the city. Though Aftalia was lost during his move back east in the fall of 1893, the martyr resurfaces throughout his career. In Chicago in 1893-1905, during his time as the head of, Wilber of music at Wilberforce University in 1904, and then on September 21st, 1947, when excerpts were performed on a self-produced Carnegie Hall concert dedicated to his compositions. It is with the martyr that we begin to see the care composer's careful navigation of his taste for European opera and the adaptability required of African-American composers attempting to integrate the genre. He called the martyr a sacred grand opera, set in Egypt during the 12th century BC. The somewhat convoluted story is best described as a socio-religious and racial origin narrative. With an amorous relation thrown in, it is opera after all. <laughs> Um, essentially, the, the title character, Platonus, the martyr, has, uh, has made his belief in a single god well known uh, to the other nobility in ancient Egypt. Um, they have uh, cast him out, as it were, um, and then ultimately leading to his execution when he, uh, when he defames a temple. Throughout the martyr, Freeman uses light motives and dense orchestration. He would even label the light motives in his score to draw attention to his application of Wagnerisms. He earned for himself later the epithet, the colored Wagner. Freeman was expressly resolute in dis distancing himself from the vernacular musical traditions of the Black South, at least in his early works. He recounted a conversation on the matter with Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who confronted the composer of his decision to ignore, quote, Negro themes, the folk, work, and camp meeting songs of the South. To which Freeman replied, I didn't intend that there should be. What do I know of these things? I was insulted, outraged, exasperated. Let somebody else do it, for it is all totally foreign to me. Do all the South before the war stuff you wish. None of it is for me and my work. 
Although the music of the martyr is rooted in Freeman's conscientious dissemblance from the musical heritage of black America, the story he chose responds to and is deeply fixed in black American experience. The prevalence of biblical themes throughout the martyr demonstrate that the composer saw this story as a metaphor for emancipation. On the first page of the score, he notes that the story is set during the reign of King Merimnet, at the time believed to be the pharaoh of the Exodus. Furthermore, there are two key beliefs of the historic black church that frame this work. First, the Old Testament God as an avenging, liberating force was a central tenet of faith in most black churches. As observed by black church historians Lincoln and Mamiya, the direct relationship between the Holocaust of slavery and the notion of divine rescue colored the theological perceptions of black laity. Second is the resonance of freedom. Set on the eve of Exodus, the presence of a slave chorus in the martyr gestured toward the imminent release of Israel from bondage. For the title character, Freeman meant an uncompromising responsibility to a singular God. To several of Freeman's performers and listeners, freedom had been experienced firsthand. Emancipation and their migration westward meant education, employment, the establishment of communities and institutions where they could create art that was their own. The contributions of the Higher Sisters and Harry Lawrence Freeman to the operatic art are just two such stories that could be told here today. They use the dignified, spiritually elevating influence of art, music, and literature to tell their stories, stories that were theirs, not the fictions that were put upon them. They force us to remember that there is a non-dominant opera culture, a shadow culture of opera, to acknowledge a concept that Professor Naomi Andre's forthcoming book defines and helps us confront, in which black participation and black subjects are really only just being explored, especially among these forgotten performers and repertoires. But these voices have been calling or singing out to us for a long time. The question is, when will we commit to hearing them? Thank you. Thank you, Austin.